Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives and the world's leading global brands. Today we have a, a special guest on the show. We're joined by Todd Churches, who's a CEO, leadership consultant, executive coach at Big Blue Gumball. He's also the author of the best-selling book, Visual Leadership, uh, leveraging the power of visual thinking in leadership and in life. Uh, welcome to the show, Todd. How are you? Chris, great to be here with you. Thank you so much. I'm coming to you from a, uh, a bunker yeah, in an undisclosed location just outside of New York City. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, first of all, how are you? And uh, I know the, the book launched recently, so congrats first and foremost on that. How are you so you personally and how have things been going? It's, it's been going really well. It's, uh, it launched a month ago. And uh, you know, one of the challenges of launching any product, and including a book during a pandemic, is uh, all your plans got screwed up, right? So all my book signings, my keynote address, I was supposed to do a big keynote address with a client in Denver that had to be canceled. And uh, um, so again, I've had a, like all of us, we've had to find a way to reinvent ourselves online through the world of Zoom and, and StreamYard and, and just uh, going global, going global, uh, but uh, doing it virtually. Yeah. How has that? How has that been? Uh, on, uh, on obviously back to back on calls, on Zooms, on uh, you said you presented to a few thousand people the other day, right? Uh, yeah, how, did, how a, that? did a webinar for fifteen hundred people globally, and uh, many of them uh, um, linked in with me, and uh, which is great. I've added about five hundred new LinkedIn connections from around the world over the last three months since the uh, since the pandemic started back in March. And um, yeah, so even though uh, my in-person events, you know, didn't happen, um, I'm, I think I'm, I actually, in some ways, benefited from a, a wider global reach because everyone's on Zoom and yeah. and uh, I belong to a number of networking groups and and conversations happening that may, probably wouldn't have happened because people tended to stay more local. Now, you know, you can go global with the with the click of a button. We found the same thing as well because yeah. um, you, you know my business. We typically do. So sort of CHRO bespoke, very intimate roundtables uh, with with companies all over the world, right? Who host our events. We had to go online. And one of the things I saw in the first few weeks is we're interacting with HR leaders around the world that we'd never normally come across because yeah. we're always focused on the regions that we operate within and live within. And now we've got people signing up for our you know, HR leaders online summit where we had 4,000 people at our last one. We have people from China, from Malaysia, from Russia, from just areas that we just, uh, you know, from the Caribbean, from, from just from places all over the world that yeah. we uh, they would never would have come across uh, and companies I'd never heard of. But then you look into them and they've got 10,000 employees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've never even heard them before. Yeah, it's uh, pretty amazing. Pretty fascinating uh, as well. But before we jump in, Todd, tell everyone a little bit more about you, yourself, you know, your background, your journey to where we are now. Sure, sure. Um, I do management leadership training and consulting and executive coaching. And um, I also am an adjunct professor of leadership at both NYU and Columbia in New York. And I'm a recent TEDx speaker last year. I did a TEDx talk on the power of visual thinking. And what's interesting is most people, especially my students, assume I have a business background, but I actually had a, I have a, um, a bachelor's degree in English literature with a concentration in Shakespeare and poetry. So um, I have a very unconventional kind of background, but I kind of try to bring the, the humanities and the arts into management, the world of management and leadership. So I remember my father saying when I was majoring in Shakespeare and poetry, he's like, what are you going to do? Walk around quoting Shakespeare all the time? You know, <laughs> how are you going to make a living? You know, just rhyming everything, sitting around, uh, you know, being the, the poor brooding poet. Um, but but being an English literature major, what was interesting is, and I do a lot of work around storytelling um, and the use of metaphor. We'll talk more about that shortly in relation to my book. But um, a big part of communication is using metaphor and analogy, telling stories, thinking of each as from a leadership perspective, each leader is the is the protagonist or the uh, the lead character in there. We're all we're all we're, we are all the the lead character in our life story, right? So mm -hmm. we all, our stories have beginnings, middles, and ends. Uh, there's victims, villains, and heroes. So what's interesting is a lot of the the um, the concepts from being an English major and reading novels and poetry, uh, I'm able to bring into my into my current work. So it's helped me be a better writer, more empathetic uh, as a leader. So uh, a lot of benefits from having that kind of background that people may not anticipate you know, at first glance. Where did this concept of visual leadership come from? Tell, give all, because I know the origin stories, which I think is pretty cool. So tell sure. everyone more about that and then describe to us what is visual leadership? Sure, sure. Um, I talk about it in my TED talk very briefly, but basically as a kid, you know, when people say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I wanted to be Superman. I was obsessed with Superman. I always say, I take my mother's, you know, dish towels or, or whatever, or sheets and 
make a cape out of it. I was always flying around the house, right? So I always wanted to be Superman. And then I got into Batman. So my backup, you know, as we know as I HR, <laughs> as we as we know as HR professionals, you need a career backup just in case your first one. So my backup plan was to be Batman if Superman didn't work out as a career. So um, what's interesting is someone mentioned recently, in a way, you are kind of a combination of Superman, Superman and Batman in your coaching. Superman, you have this, you talk really fast. I'll try to slow it down a little bit, but so super speed in terms of my talking, uh, so a little super strengths in certain areas, but instead of visual, instead of x-ray vision, I, I have visual thinking as my superpower. And in terms of Batman, my utility belt is filled with all of my coaching tools, right? So in a way, a little bit of a combination of both of those. So, um, but my dream from a young age was to work in the TV industry in some capacity. So I packed up from, I'm, I grew up in New York City, and then I moved to Los Angeles to look for a job in the TV industry. And I had a number of temporary jobs. I was an intern. I had some really bad um, temp jobs. Um, I worked as a bouncer in a club. That's a whole other story. Uh, until one night I got punched in the face and got my glasses broken. That kind of ended my bouncing career. Um, but uh, yeah, I made a lot of ex life and work experiences until I finally got into the TV industry. But like a lot of things, unfortunately, it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. I had so many horrible bosses. Just you know, We have the Harvey Weinsteins of the world, right? So many abusive, horrible, egocentric, um, egotistical bosses. It's all that industry like like wall street and certain other industries was all about power and control and ego and money didn't really fit my values i didn't really fit in there but uh the good thing about it i had so many horrible bosses that it eventually dr led me to my career in in management leadership consulting trying to change the world by helping people become uh, better leaders and did, didn't you move from that into sort of the uh entertainment side as well yeah, I was in the TV industry in a number of capacities. And then when I left television, I got a job. My friend was working for a theme park design company. So I got a job working for a theme park company. And I took a job as a project coordinator just because I had those kinds of skills. and I just needed a job. Um, and the project manager was moved on to another project. And they said, oh, you're now the project manager. And I had no idea how to manage a project. Um, and he said, oh, by the way, you need to go to China to oversee the installation. I'm like, at that time, I did not have a passport. I had never been out of the United States. I was terrified of flying. And they're sh putting me on a plane and shipping me to Shenzhen, China, which I didn't <laughs> even know where it was on the map. But it's right across the border from Hong Kong. So we manufactured these life-size robotic animal figures like you would see in a theme park at Disneyland or Universal Studios. Um, so we manufactured them in LA, shipped them by shipping container across the Pacific Ocean to China. I got there with two crew members, an engineer and a technician, to install them. But all the people at the uh, theme park, didn't. no one spoke English at all, including the translator. The translator spoke no English. So that doesn't really <laughs> The translator right. didn't speak yeah. English. <laughs> Good translator. So, uh, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, um, so basically, we had to get this installation done. And what basically what I did was we needed tools. We needed. To, we basically got it done through drawing. I actually took out pieces of paper, envelopes, whatever I had, and started sketching things out. So, if we needed a hammer or a tape measure, even though I really couldn't draw, I wasn't really an artist. I sketched things out and a point, and I pointed. So, I don't know if you guys have in the UK. Uh, the games Pictionary and Charades, but that's yeah. basically what I was doing. You did that uh, to build everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I basically drew pictures, and when we pointed, and we got it done. So there was a light bulb that went off, and said, you know, if we can't, one way to communicate across cultures and and other barriers is to use visual thinking. Drawing is just one of them. Body language is another, and we'll talk more about how I came up with the visual leadership concept. But in a nutshell, that's basically the origin story of how I transitioned from. Uh, the, the the my English literature, literature type background to the entertainment industry, and I eventually got a job in management and leadership consulting field when I moved back to New York after ten years in Los Angeles, and I applied. That was my unique kind of approach was to apply what I learned from the entertainment industry into the world of management leadership training and mm -hmm. consulting. How do you describe to someone what visual leadership is? Visual leadership, as you could see on the screen, if you're looking at it, or if not, picture the word uh, visual leadership spelled as instead of two words, one word with a single L unifying them. And the concept of visual leadership is that as a leader, your vision is in inseparable from who you are and how you lead, right? Your view of the world. When we talk about leadership, um, we talk about so-and-so being a visionary leader, right? An Elon Musk or a Steve Jobs, right? Uh, we talk about what is your leadership vision, right? What does it mean to have a vision? It means to have a picture, right? Literally a picture in your mind's eye of the future, a picture of the future from and better than the quality, right? So if you talk
talk about a vision as a leader, clear and compelling vision. And the other is to communicate it and get it out there into the world to make that vision a reality through and with other people, right? You can't do it all yourself. Even if you're a solopreneur, you still need to rely mm -hmm. on other people, right? So my one of my mantras is how do you get people to see what you're saying? How do you get an idea out of your head into someone else? And that's the foundation of visual leadership. It's about using a variety of different visual thinking based tools, tips, and techniques that we'll talk about shortly to get that vision out there into the world. So you already have been doing this work for a while. What, when, when did the point become say, I need to put this in a book? <laughs> yeah, so, so basically when I moved back from LA, I got a job for a, one, a, one of the United States' uh, leading training companies, the worst managed company I'd ever seen in my life. And I had seen a lot of them. It was just a, a toxic, dysfunctional environment. They're still around and they're much better today. So I don't want anyone bashing them today. But at the time, they were going through management turnover. There was a lot of dysfunction. There was a lot of infighting. And I realized that, and I was hired to revamp their mini MBA program. Um, they had a four week, um, five days each session uh, leadership program. And I was, I was always, I just have to say it, um, even though I talk fast and loud because I'm from New York, I'm an extreme introvert. I'm an introvert, bookworm, nerd. So I was always one of these back of the rooms, behind the scenes kind of guys. I never in a million years thought I would be out there front and center, even talking to someone like you on a podcast like this. I was overseeing a program one time in uh, Hilton Head, South Carolina, and the facilitator didn't show up. He got sick and missed his flight. So we were there with 12 CEOs. We had to deliver this leadership, leadership training. I called back to my boss in New York and I said, what do I do? He said, well, we have two choices. We either cancel it and be completely humiliated and have to refund all this money to all the 12 CEOs who showed up, or you're going to have to do the course. So he said, you know, all the content inside and out. What's the problem? Like, what's the problem? I've never, I can't even speak to one person. I'm supposed to get up in front of 12 CEOs. And you know what? I did it and I didn't know the content. And I, and I basically told them the situation and they were very empathetic and, and we worked together and got through that first day. The instructor got there the second day. And uh, to be honest, I was a little disappointed because I didn't hate it as much as I thought I would. And I wasn't as bad as I thought I was going to be. And I kind of got the bug of, you know, maybe there's a seed here. So I developed that skill over the years. And I eventually became a, uh, a trainer, public speaker, and, and an executive coach. So now I do this for a living. And uh, I never would have envisioned doing this. If I wasn't thrown into that situation, I never mm -hmm. would have volunteered to do it. So that's a good example of, you know, sometimes we have potential in people or in ourselves. And until we're thrown in or forced in and have no other choice, we don't test the waters. And then once we do, and I write a, a story about that in my book where as a kid, I went to a, a pool club that some friends invited us to a swimming pool and they had that high diving board. And I saw all the other kids jumping off and having so much fun. I said, that looks like fun. I got to the end. I was terrified to jump. So I went to turn around and all the other kids were already up on the ladder saying, will you jump already? You're holding up the whole line. And they had no choice but to jump. After that, I spent the rest of the day just diving off that high diving board. So it's like, it. again, sometimes we're just thrown into a situation and we have to force ourselves out of our comfort zone. And then we do and we say, hey, wow, try mm -hmm. something different. And, uh, and this is kind of yeah. cool. How do we get an idea out of your head into someone else's so that they can see what you're saying? Yeah, it doesn't matter whatever role you have. I mean, whether you're trying to get a child to do something, a parent to do something, a client, um, right? It's all about influence, right? It's all about how do you convince someone, get their buy-in. And if they don't see it, if they don't see what you're saying, it's very hard to get them to say, hey, I agree with that or let's do it. I break it down to four different categories. So I talk about it as the first category is using visual imagery and drawing. So basically pictures, whether you use a PowerPoint mm -hmm. slide or image from a magazine or you sketch something out, that's category one is visual imagery. Category two is the use of mental models and frameworks. That could be an org chart, right? If you think about that as an HR person, your org chart is a visual model of representation of the reality of who reports to who and who has what, what jobs, right? So process diagrams and maps. Maps are an example of a mental model, right? A map of London or a map of the New York subway system is going to help you get around by conceptualizing what the physical reality is, right? So that's category two. Category three is the use of metaphor and analogy, comparing one thing to something else, right? So if I use a baseball analogy with someone from the UK, it may not resonate. A, a soccer slash football analogy may go over better, right? So thinking of metaphors and analogies that resonate with your audience is key because a good an analogy will, will create clarity. A bad one will actually cause more confusion, right? So that's metaphor and analogy. And the fourth category is storytelling. And you get extra points if you combine storytelling with humor. 
And that's not, and I'm not talking about jokes. I'm talking about finding the humor in everyday life and in everyday work. So those are the four categories. They're not mutually exclusive. When used in combination, you could have a visual image that's accompanied by a story. You could have a mental model where you use a metaphor to explain it, right? So you could use these all in combination. But if you break it down to these four categories, it kind of gives you a menu of options from which to choose. So that's kind of how I break it down. And the first two, the imagery and the models are more tangible because those are things that we typically see with the physical eye. Storytelling and metaphor are more intangible because those could be communicated verbally without any pictures, right? So if you're listening to this podcast in an auditory way, just, just the sound without any images, you're processing. You may be hearing these stories and picturing them in your mind's eye yes. just as if you were watching, listening to something on the radio versus watching something on television. Yeah, I used to use a lot of those techniques when I was in sales. Yeah, you know, imagine yourself driving down the road with the rooftop down in that new car, exactly. right? Yeah. You know, the client on the other side is like thinking about the wind in your hair. How would that make you feel? And then you know, yeah. and then and then sort of mix, mix, mixing the feelings and emotions with the visual uh, as well is super powerful. Exactly. Yeah, because a lot of salespeople, may, you may try to sell someone a car based on how many you know horsepower and how yes. fast in the engine and all the oh. technical stuff. What sells a car, right, is that feeling that you're going to get when you're driving it. It's not what's under the hood. It's how you feel when you're behind the wheel, right? So people who don't know that, you know, kind of are, are not shooting at the target. And one of the classic examples of that, for example, communicating numbers. HR people have to communicate numbers all the time, right? So if you start just talking about percentages, you put people to sleep and, and it may not resonate. Well, if you tell a story behind it or tell use an analogy that resonates, resonates with your audience, you're going to get a lot further. So like a classic example is when Steve Jobs in, uh, introduced the, iP the iPod, he, instead of saying this, this holds five gigabytes of data means nothing. If you say this holds a thousand songs in your pocket, that's amazing, right? My whole CD collection can fit on that little thing. That's unbelievable. Who yeah. cares about how many gigs it holds? It's the carrying your music around with you is what sells the product, right? So that's like a classic example of how you could translate statistics and data into language and imagery that's meaningful to your audience. One of the things that stood out to me as well when um, speaking with you last time is that mo most leaders that I've spoken to certainly don't talk about visual communication as part of their leadership toolbox. Is that something you find when you speak to other you know, CEOs around the world? Yeah, what's interesting is I was doing a uh, workshop on storytelling for a group of CEOs, about 20 CEOs. And one of the CEOs said, um, I hate storytelling. I'm terrible at storytelling. I said, why do you say that? And he told this great story about how horrible he was at storytelling. So we're all storytellers. Children tell stories. Grandparents tell stories. Um, if someone says, how was work today? And you come home and say, oh, you wouldn't believe what happened to me today. That's a story, right? So I think when we magnify leadership storytelling, it becomes scary and intimidating. But if we just think about it as being vulnerable and sharing your life experiences for the purpose of communicating ideas, getting a message across or influencing, just by reframing it, and reframing is a metaphor, right? We're putting a new frame around it. By thinking about it in a, do, in a new way, you're more effective. So you could say to a new employee, do this or don't do this. Or you can say, let me tell you about the worst mistake I ever, ha I ever made when I had your job right? Makes you vulnerable, makes you human, and it teaches a lesson that will resonate with and stick with the person. I always talk about when people say, why visuals? What well, is it about visuals that makes them so powerful? It's three words and they kind of rhyme. And I talk about this in my TED talk as well. Attention, comprehension, and retention. When you use visual imagery or whether it's pictures or language, right? It gets your attention. So if you're showing someone something, we're both looking at the same thing. So right there, that's the attention piece. Comprehension is understanding. If you look at something, if I say to you, oh, next time you're in New York, you go down this street, you make a left here, you make a right here. It doesn't mean anything to you. It's going to be in one ear and out the other. But if I give you a map, when you get to New York, you take out your map and say, I know how to get to Times Square. I know how to get to Broadway, right? That's the uh, comprehension piece. You understand through the power of visual. And then retention our brain is just wired for images. So we remember, so in terms of memory and recall, visual imagery, science has shown, gets uh, really? stuck in our head for much more effectively than words or numbers do. So attention, comprehension, and retention are the reasons why visuals are so powerful. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to ask you that as my next question, is there research behind that? I'm not surprised that, you know, because whether it's verbal, written, visual, I know personally for me, it's always been visual. Mm -hmm. I remember things so much better if I can see it. Yep. That, I, that, I, that I remember it. Whereas if I, if I write it down mm -hmm. or even if I say it out loud, I don't really remember it. Yeah. Think about the difference between communicating via email versus spoken, right? Emails 
could be misinterpreted, right? We process it through our own filters and we don't see tone of voice. We don't see that smile, right? You could, you could use, and this is a perfect example of use of visual thinking. If I say something that may have one meaning, but if I put a little smile face emoticon next to it, a little emoji, you know, oh, he's just kidding, right? That was meant to be a joke. So that's a great example of using a visual to punctuate what you're saying. Right. And one of the mm -hmm. things I talk about in the book, just very, very briefly, is that if you think about it, caveman cave drawings existed from 40,000 years ago, right? Long before the written word was it even invented. So people have been drawing and using visual imagery to communicate, hey, the big bison is here. And you see the person with the, you know, the spear trying to chase after the buffalo or whatever in the cave drawing. That existed long before even Egyptian hieroglyphics, right? So and Egyptian hieroglyphics are basically pictograms that evolved yeah. into our current alphabet. And then today we use emojis and emoticons, right? So if you think about a heart, right? If you sense on a heart, meaning I like it or I love you, the heart is a metaphor, right? It's a visual metaphor. Our human heart in our body does not look like a Valentine, right? It's not, and if you gave someone a human heart as a Valentine, I don't think it would go over too well with your wife or you know, significant other, right? So it's mm -hmm. that symbol of what that idea represents and that heart is a universal symbol for love and passion and, and I like this, right? So we communicate visually in symbols just as well as we do with hand gestures and, and other ways to communicate. Um, one of the stories I, I talk about in, in my book is I was at a restaurant. Americans, as you know, use a lot of ice in our drinks, right? So, and in, in, I know in the UK, I, know, I, asked I, for, I noticed that. Yeah, that's a thing, isn't it? <laughs> I, when I was in London, I asked for ice. They gave me one single cube. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So, and then I asked for, can I have a full glass of ice? They brought me two cubes. So I don't know. I would have paid, you know, an extra <laughs> couple of pounds for an ice cube. But um, I was once in the restaurant. I said, can I have some more ice? And they brought me a, a, a bowl of white rice instead of ice. So I said ice, they heard rice, and I got a bowl of rice, which I actually needed because I, I, I finished my rice that came with my with my meal. But whose fault was that, right? What I could have done is I, I, if I went like this, can I have some more ice and point it to my glass, they, go wrong. Yeah. they would have known. So that's an example of using visuals, body language to communicate. The burden of communication is on the communicator. So if you ask whose fault was it, mine or the waiter's, it was my fault, right? Even though it's kind of mutual, he misinterpreted what I said, I could have done something better to improve that communication. And using hand gestures is a great way to communicate visually to get your idea across. When we first spoke, when I first reached out and we had a chat, I shared some of my own sort of stories um, in terms of my own visual, how I, I use visual leadership without even realizing it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but what, what are some of your favorite stories that you share in the book from the CEOs um, that you've spoken to that, that do this successfully? Yeah, well, most of my stories are my own. Um, so I, I do talk to a few different people. Um, one of the stories I use in the book is uh, a lot of, I break the book down to three sections. One is on leading through mental models and frameworks. One is leading through metaphor and the other is leading through storytelling. So I kind of break it down and all of them have imagery throughout. So my book is all in full color and each chapter has a visual image, either a model or some kind of imagery. So one example was um, when I was growing up, I call it yellow ball leadership. When I was a kid growing up, I would take three balls, a, a red ball, blue ball, and yellow ball, and throw it to my dog and say, Coco, that's not her real name. I changed her name to protect her anonymity in the book. Um, so I said, Coco, go get the yellow ball. And she'd bring back the yellow ball. And people would be like, wow, that's so amazing. How'd you train her to do that? Well, when I threw the three balls, she always brought back the yellow ball for whatever reason. She just liked the <laughs> yellow ball better, right? So one of the metaphors there is, are you setting your people up for success? Are you learning what motivates them, what they like and what they prefer? If you give them three tasks to do, what's the equivalent of the yellow ball, the one that they're always going to gravitate towards? Because if they do, if someone has a passion and a purpose and an interest and a skill, they're going to gravitate towards that. Now, sometimes uh, you take away the yellow ball and just throw the red and blue one and see which one they go for, right? Similarly, in a job, some person may always say, oh, they raise their hand. Oh, I'll do the PowerPoint slides. I'll do the PowerPoint slides. But make, maybe you want to develop them to do be better at Excel, doing spreadsheets and graphs. You take away the PowerPoint from them, let someone else do it. That's the yellow ball. And you say, of the, you know, the Word document or the Excel, which would you rather do? You're helping them develop a skill in what, either the red ball or the blue ball. So right there, that's a metaphor. It has nothing to do with my dog. has nothing to do with the ball. But it's a lesson there that people that resonates with people because of the story. And, and you can actually visualize those three colors in your mind's eye. So I told that whole story. You're picturing a dog chasing a ball, and yet you're creating this mental movie. So even if I asked you what kind of dog was it, let me ask I'm you. I'm thinking of a small dog, a very what? small, like a chihuahua, Coco. What color? What color? Like, uh, like, like a light brown. 
<laughs> yeah, right? So just from its name, you formulate a visual image in your mind's eye, right? So it's interesting and great. So you may picture a chihuahua, someone else may picture a poodle, right? But we create a mental movie in our mind and sometimes you, you could be 100% right. I could say, hey, you're right. That's exactly what she was. Or I could say you're complete. she was a little white poodle and you're thinking of brown chihuahua and you're thinking, why do you name her Coco if she's a white poodle, right? So that's a whole other conversation. But that's a perfect example in just one story. And it used metaphor, it used storytelling, it used color, it used animal imagery. It was something that anyone could relate to because we all, right? So it was universal in its message. So that's just in one like two minute story has, and I, I may ask you, what, like, let me ask you, what did you take from that story, Chris? Like, what could you take and apply in your life or your work? Uh, one of the things I thought was getting people out of their comfort zone, because normally we'd all, we all run for the yellow ball, right? Yeah. Because it's something we're comfortable with, we know we can do it, uh, it's, it's safe yeah. uh, as well. Whereas, you know, taking that away and getting them to chase the other two balls is going to stretch them, grow them, develop new skills. So that was the first thing. That's great. That's, yeah. that's, that's, that's great. great for me. It's great. There's no wrong answer, right? And then I would say to you, so based on that, what's one change you could make or one thing you could do differently that will help you set people up for success so that they're not always chasing the yellow ball, right? So we can have a whole conversation around that. So that's a perfect example of using metaphor and analogy. Another metaphor similar is I asked, what is your leadership weather report? Are you a cloud of doom and gloom or are you a ray of sunshine? Right. So when you so you know how some people when they walk into the room, like the party starts and it lights up and the energy just comes up, and the other people walk into the room and everyone puts their head down. Oh, just like, fear. Oh, it's like, oh my god, it's, you know, they're on the floor. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, we've I've, I've, been, I've worked for leaders like that. <laughs> so, exactly. So when I, the way I phrase it is so I ask people, what is your weather report? We as a leader, we create a culture and a climate, right? That that permeates us and that, that fills the room or the space, even when we're online, right? So what's the there's a a virtual remote equivalent of that but when i ask people yeah you are you thunder and lightning or are you lighting people up right there's a saying classic saying not mine but um instead of lighting a fire under people you should be lighting a fire within them right mm -hmm. so you yeah. can kind of build compliance and cooperation but are you getting commitment right are you getting you could in the short term you can get someone to do something but is that sustainable over the long term right so again that metaphor of fire and now the second example and thinking about your your weather report say yes yeah, sometimes if i walk in like years ago when i worked for a tv network out in la i'd say good morning to my boss oh good morning and she i won't mention her name um and <laughs> she'd say oh what's good about it? another day in this hellhole so oh, it's like great. Boss, That's what you need in the morning. Yeah, so if your <laughs> boss starts out with that attitude, imagine how your day is going to be. And it usually went progressively downhill from there. Yeah. Can you talk about um, the three E's? Yeah, the three E's are educate, engage, and excite. So in any communication or any interaction, you want to think about educate. What do you want people to know and learn? Engage is how am I going to capture and hold their attention? And excite is how am I going to get them emotionally inspired to go out and do this? How am I going to you know, influence them and help to change them, right? So in any workshop I do, in any blog post I write, in any conversation I have, any coaching session, for example, you want to think about what do you want them to know? I always say that the true value of knowledge is not in its accumulation, but in its application, right? It's like, how are you going to use this stuff? We could read a million books. And I didn't tell that story about when you asked about how I wrote my book. When I was working for that management company, I was obsessed. I started reading management and leadership books and I got obsessed. So I, some weeks, weeks I would read one or two, others three or four or five. And I started reading an average of one a week over 20 years from 1998 to 2018 when I started working on my own book. So I've read over a thousand. You can see many of them in the bookshelves behind me, probably closer to 1200 now business books over the course of the last 22 years. So um, we take in all this information, but the key is what are you going to do with it? So what happened was after studying all these business models and we, we know, you know, like this uh, SWOT analysis matrix or, um, or situational leadership, right? There's all these models out there. What I started doing is creating my own models. And that's how I ended up writing my book is with all the stories I would tell and models I would create, people kept my students, my clients, friends, they would say, you need to write a book one of these days. And that one of these days, eventually happened. And I got a book deal with Post Hill Press, Simon & Schuster after I got a literary agent and I got the book out there into the world. So it's kind of nice and exciting to have people. I, got a, I was just mentioning, I got a, a fan letter from Singapore the other day. So I was saying, I, I got your Kindle copy. I read it in two days and I loved it. So it's cool how it's uh, it's crossing cultural lines because the visual component is something that, and it's universal, right? We can all relate to these stories. And the key is to come up with your own images, your own stories. And you told me about your basketball hoop story. I loved, I keep thinking about it when we talked a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. If you could share that, I think everyone would really benefit from that. Yeah, where do I start? 
<laughs> yeah, that's a long story. See, myself and Todd were speaking about this beforehand about having visual triggers, right? Um, and one of mine, uh, which I didn't realize it until Todd said it, was a basketball hoop. So at my parents' house, uh, even when I go and visit my, my parents now, there's this really old, rusty, bent, weathered basketball hoop kind of barely hanging on to the wall. Mm. Just to give everyone a visual of it. <laughs> it's beaten up. It's barely hanging on. And I told my mom, just leave it there because she wanted to take it down. And the reason why is that when I was younger, I, I was bullied quite a lot in school. And I was, I, I made up this plan, uh, you know, how do, I literally sat down and wrote out a plan of how to stop getting bullied, which sounds pretty crazy <laughs> at the time of saying it. And what I did, I realized that all of the bullies were on the basketball team, right? So I was like, if I can become really good at basketball, like amazing at basketball and then join the basketball team, they'll leave me alone. So I, I, I asked my mom to buy me this basketball hoop, which was quite a, a, tough for us at the time because, you know, single parent, four kids was living on benefits. So that was a big expense to buy a basketball hoop. She bought that and I spent the entire summer holidays every single day just playing basketball. And before this, I'd not played any sports every day until the day I, till, until the sun rise and the sun went down literally every day. Long story short, I went to that basketball tryout, which was like going into the lion's den like you know it was pretty crazy walking in the changing room with all of the bullies looking at me like oh my god what is he doing here um to going on to that basketball hall, court small skinny you know the smallest guy there frail pretty weak still but I, I what i could do is hit free throws so i could just practice three pointers the entire time i knew i didn't have the speen i didn't i knew i didn't have the strength but i knew i could hit the three pointers mm -hmm. and uh, got through the trials barely made the team and the plan worked. I became one of the most successful basketball players in school. Um, and then from that day onwards, I realized that, you know, learning was my new superpower. Like I could be and do anything as long as I'm willing to put hard work in and learn and develop. So, and then it became skateboarding then ice hockey, then table tennis, then sales. I took the same approach in sales. But for me, every time I go to visit my parents and I see that basketball hoop yeah. hanging off the side, for me, it just makes you smile and it brings back all those memories of that's where it all started. William Wordsworth uh, wrote an essay about poetry and he talks about poetry being about emotion, recollected and tranquility. And it's, it was related to his poem, The Daffodils, where he says, for oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. See, my poetry major coming in handy. So he could be sitting on his couch in his living room. He'll picture those daffodils in his mind's eye and he'll experience the same emotion that he felt the very first time he saw it, right? So yeah. similarly, when you think about that basketball hoop, that is your daffodil, right? That Or Marcel Proust wrote about the Madeleine in, uh, in, in his famous novel. Um, so that image is such a symbol of so much more. To, to, to someone else, that's just a basketball hoop hanging by a thread. To you, that's a symbol of transformation, change, and other things, right? So it's amazing mm -hmm. the power of visual imagery, symbols, what a basketball hoop means to you. Um, also, as you were, I jotted it down, the number metaphors you use, it was like walking into the lion's den, right? So we use metaphors as part of our language all the time. So I could picture you walking in, and I visualize all these kids on your <laughs> basketball team as if they were lions, and you walk well, in into like Roman. Yeah. Injured yeah, gazelle. You, <laughs> you walk into the Col Colosseum in, the, in Rome, right? You're a gazelle being attacked, right? But just <laughs> think about the power of visual imagery, right? To say I walked into the lion's den, we use metaphor and analogy all the time. The magic of visual thinking is now, once you're aware of it, you notice it when other people do it, and we could be more purposeful. Like you said, you know, that's one of your, learning is one of your superpowers, right? So I actually pictured you like with a Superman with a cape on, and you're a super learner, right? You take what you learn from that experience, and like you said, you apply it to sales. Did, did, weren't you involved in dance at some point? Dance, of, yeah, I, right? I was a professional dancer for a while, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I realized that I probably could do anything, uh, and, and even to this day, it's just so cool to just be able to just whatever you want to do, just be be great here. My one of my um, former employees bought me a book for Christmas, our Christmas Secret Santa, and it was it, the book was how to be good at how to be good at everything. <laughs> and everyone was like, "You're so annoying. You're good at everything." I was like, "I'm not good at everything. It's just I, I'm I'm willing to go through the process of being yeah. terrible <laughs> at yeah. something, and I love that journey. If anything, for me." I get upset when I get good at things. If that makes any sense because it's the the journey of getting there, which is mm. what I love, not the end goal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some um, people enjoy the destined the journey more than the destination, and yeah. we're all 
one of the metaphors I use in the book and in my classes is that of the leadership journey, right? So there's, there's an image I use, I'm going to describe it. It's a, you're from the inside of a car, you see a windshield, a rear view mirror, and the steering wheel and dashboard, right? So the windshield represents the future, right? That's the road ahead. That's the, we can only see the future for as far as the eye can see. We don't know what's over the horizon. So that's the windshield and the, and the road ahead. The rear view mirror represents where we came from, our background, our baggage, our culture, our learning, our, mis our successes, but also our failures. And the mirror also represents taking the time to pull over and looking in the mirror literally to, to reflect, right? We mm -hmm. need to sometimes, whether it's through journaling or meditation, we need to look at ourselves in the mirror and say who we are, how we are, what do I need to change? Also, what's, what am I good at, right? Pats on the back. And the, the, the dashboard represents how do you measure success, right? In HR, we have a variety of different metrics that we use to gauge the success of an organization, right? Um, similarly, for yourself, on your leadership journey, how do you measure success? How do you know how well you're doing on your journey? And then all the other metaphors, the steering wheel. And what's interesting is when I show that image, people from the UK or Hong Kong will say, hey, the steering wheel is on the wrong side, right? <laughs> so that shows. Visually, also, <laughs> yeah. So visually, for Americans, it's like you, you wouldn't even think about that, right? But we, if we put ourselves in the shoes or in the driver's seat of someone else, we realize that not everyone's in the same seat, right? Sometimes as a driver, you need to have your hands on the wheel as a leader. Sometimes when do you move over to the passenger seat and just navigate and let someone else drive? And when do you sit in the back seat and say, you know what? You navigate, you drive, and I'm just going to come along for the ride. Okay. So there's a saying, you know, you need to lead, follow, or get out of the way. The best leaders know when to do which, right? Sometimes you need to step up front. Sometimes you step aside, let someone else lead. Like like geese in a flying in a V formation, that lead goose sometimes should drop back and let another goose come up and lead that V formation, right? So there's so many metaphors and analogies from nature, from driving, from whatever. If we look for them, if we're aware of it, we'll find them. And then you find that image or that metaphor that resonates with your audience, and you can have a tremendous impact. Mm -hmm. Love it. Love it. Well, we can talk about this forever, Todd. Yes. <laughs> We definitely can. There's no shortage of metaphors, analogies, no, and stories. And everyone has a story, about, right? Yeah. yeah everyone has does. a story. And I, I didn't even realize that story meant so much to me until you said it. And then since we sp last spoke, I've been thinking about it quite a lot yeah. um, as well. And it's been it popping into my mind. And I'll probably tell that story more often now. Yeah, um, it's great. I, it, was, it was quite, you know, close. It was a bad time for me. Like, yeah. you know, at that time, it was a horrible you know, a thing to go through and in yeah. being bullied, I didn't want to go to school. So I didn't really want to bring that up in my you know thought process. But now I realize that was kind of that adversity and that journey is kind of, that is a very powerful moment. That, that yeah, sometimes we take the worst experiences and sweep them under the rug because they're so painful and, and so tra traumatic. And yet, if we recognize the fact that our resilience and overcoming it, it'll help, it'll help us overcome other things in the future. So like that story you told me when we first spoke a couple of weeks ago i just installed a basketball hoop in my driveway here um and it keeps coming back to me i'm shooting free throws or whatever and you you pop into my head and that story pops into my head and like that's the power of leadership storytelling is a story will stay with people and resonate and impact them and influence them in a way that facts and figures just don't you know yeah. that's the power of visual leadership in action mm -hmm. well look, Tom, before i let you go if there's yeah. sort of a uh, one parting piece uh, of guidance to everyone, what would that be? And then where's the best place for people to connect with you and grab a copy of the book? Sure. The best place to catch a copy of the book, I'll start with that, is on Amazon or wherever you buy books. So it's Amazon <laughs> US, UK, wherever it is. Uh, so it's very exciting. It's hardcover or Kindle. Um, my brand new website is going to be launching within the next week or two, and it's toddchurches.com. So my company is called Big Blue Gumball. And Big Blue Gumball is a metaphor that represents the world. To us, the world is like a big blue gumball, however you want to see it. So we mm -hmm. still have that website, but I just am going to be launching my toddchurches.com website for my speaking and for my book. And you can check. It's live now. So if you want to check it out, toddchurches.com, and it's C-H-E-R-C-H-E-S. And um, parting thoughts. Um, there's a quote from Marcel Proust that I use in my book and my TED Talk, and it resonates with me, where he says that the real voyage of discovery is not in seeking new lands, but in seeing with new eyes. And I think if we leave here today, just seeing the world with new eyes and saying, how could I use imagery? How could I draw? How could I use models and metaphors? How could I use stories? And how could I use humor? We're going to be, in a, you're going to be a more effective leader by using all of these different methods rather than just trying to use facts and figures to motivate and to inspire. Fantastic. Well, look, thank you so much for joining. It was a, a real pleasure having Christmas. you on the show, oh. truly. And look forward to chatting again soon, okay? This was great. Thank you for having me, Chris. Greatly appreciate it. No problem. See you later.